Welcome to Meaningful Desire. This is part two of my reading of the book by Forrest Landry, An Imminent Metaphysics. In part one, I covered the first three paragraphs of the introduction to the book. And in this episode, I'll be covering the next three paragraphs, four, five, six. Enjoy! Introduction, paragraph four. To allow maximum emphasis on essentials in a minimum of text, this book does not contain much in the way of explanation, historical background, metaphor, or statement of implication. Requiring a reader to wade through too much of this type of content would obscure too much of what is really important. While such content aids understanding in the short term, it often results in long-term misunderstanding. Times change and such external references do not keep up. As such, these aspects are made available in supplemental books, recordings, and transcripts. Paragraph five, by focusing only on those ideas that are of primary significance and importance, the text may seem to some readers to be more intense, dense, technical than standard prose. In recognition of the need for a deep clarity, a certain amount of special terminology must be allowed for. The selective use of appropriate ter terminology frees the reader and the author from painful error misunderstanding and confusion. While a simplified and non-specialist terminology may be preferred for general audiences, the hidden and implicit complexity of a common language format precludes the distillation of essential notions into precise expressions of concept. Although ultimately the axioms of this metaphysics are very simple, a full knowledge of their meaning implications and applications is much more involved and complex. Paragraph six, the emphasis on precise expressions of meaning is not, however, to be construed as an attempt to prove logically or analytically the general validity and applicability of any of the assertions herein. It is not an attempt to convince anyone of anything. Readers who are looking to be convinced that some metaphysical proposition is absolutely true will need to do their own work to determine, prove, and validate their own ideas of truth. Awesome. Now I invite you to pre press pause so that you may reflect on what I've just read. And then after you've had your moment of reflection, you can press play and to hear my reflection. Yay! Hmm. So reading paragraphs four, five, six, I'm reminded of firstly, like DNA, you know, the, so each cell in my body has DNA, which has instructions to, to create proteins, to fold proteins in a certain way. And it has like the blueprint for the whole of me. But the expression of this blueprint would depend on where the cell is, what kind of cell it is. So if it's a cell that comprises my eyes, then only those parts of the DNA relevant to that, the genes relevant to that, the coding 
genes relevant to that will be invoked or will will be activated to create my eyes when I was in the embryonic stage. And I suppose that also happens, you know, when I shed skin, I grow hair and and the like. So in a way when I'm I see this book because it's like the he tried forest land, he tried to condense the ideas, the key points of me- of his form of metaphysics, to me it's like DNA, and then me interacting with it, it's like the epigenetics of it. It's like the how, whatever part of this, of the book, the DNA, that I find relevant, then that will be expressed in the same way that different genetics will be expressed in, in, in the proteins. He also mentioned there that um, there's not much explanation, not much metaphor. And in the previous part one, I did mention that one reason why that would that could be useful is that in the short term all these explanations will help the reader understand better but in the long term it might be a source of misunderstanding so a better way is to have this book separate from the transcripts from the other things that link to the book so i i suppose this thing i'm doing now will be part of those and and yeah, it kind of works because um, I never, before I knew of this book, I knew about it because I subscribed to this podcast, Collective Insights podcast by the Neurohacker Collective. And I, one of the episodes was Forrest Landry being interviewed by Daniel Schmachtenberger. And they talked about like the ideas of forest. And and one thing that really caught that, that, that really caught my attention when I was listening to this episode was when Forrest said this up up horizon loves that which enables choice. And then it's like, wow, I've been thinking about that since I heard that. And, and during this episode, they did discuss some of the key fundamentals that are in this book. So I think the episode went for more than an hour, I mean, almost two hours. I kind of can't remember exactly now. But then they referred to this book, which is available to download. So I will put the link to where you can get the PDF of this book in the show notes for this episode. Yeah, so so after I've heard that podcast, I downloaded the book, started reading it. I also listened to some other podcasts done by Forrest, like in the Jim Rutt show and some earlier ones. And I did check out his uh, company that makes the flight magic it's like um it's like high-end artisanal woodworked um vaporizers very interesting and and he seems to have an interesting background for us he's he was deep into computer science and programming but he went to woodwork and working with his hands and and he cre- he wrote this yeah so so that's one bit that I that came to me. Another bit that came is um, he says that we will see as we go on the journey of this book. We will see that there are some words 
that he redefines, either redefines or he coins new terminology. There seems to be a lot of this happening. In fact, in in the in the rebel wisdom and the Stoa community communities that I participate in, it even it even as a term like people have their word coinage game. You know, they have their coinage game. So in in this three paragraphs, he 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 refers to sometimes we need to do this to avoid mis misunderstandings on the part of of the author and the reader as well. And I can understand that because some sometimes when we just use words in the common parlance, in, in the common, out there in the wild, words out there in the wild, it has some word gravity sometimes because it's associated by the culture to specific things. But in fact, we may, mean something different. So like, just like, um, it's like I'm also following Jean Verveke in his uh, ever-growing series and focus on the meaning crisis and now the meta crisis. And he he's resurrecting some Greek words because the English equivalent has been, um, the meaning has changed, like dialogue is, has some connotations now because of how dialogue has been used in the media and the press, which is quite different from the, which, has, which, which, which is different now from the original ter Greek term dialogos. You know, it's like two logos interfacing with each other. It's not just, I think dialogue is now meant to, to, to be more about propositional knowing rather than more about participative knowing. Yeah, these terms, uh, I, I might refer to them as we go along, but if you're curious about this, uh, I learned this from Jean Verveke's series in YouTube, which I highly recommend on the meaning crisis, where he talks about there's uh, different kinds of knowing this participative knowing where there's, I'm an agent in the world, in an environment, and I'm participating and always having relevance, realization, finding what's relevant to me in the environment, in what he calls my salience landscape. And then there's also perspectival knowing where I take a perspective on things and how I see the world and how I map the world. There's procedural knowing, just the knowing in doing things, which may not necessarily be explicit. Like, like I do a lot of dancing now. I, I can't explain to you how I do it, but I just know how to do it. That's procedural knowing. Yeah, I, I can't really write an essay about it. You just have to watch my videos of me dancing. And that's, that's to me, that's procedural knowing. And then there's propositional knowing. And there's lots of that in Facebook where <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, and all this social media where people are saying that this is the truth. This statement is the truth. But these are just propositions. I mean, it's good because it we can preserve some, some aspect of the dialogos as propositions, but it's not the same as being in real dialogue with another person that's live, that's real time, that's dynamic, that the connection, there's a dynamic connection with the other person. Yeah, so, so there's that. And lastly, on the, on, the, on the sixth paragraph, he says that, yeah, we, this, um, the words we use here are simplified, stripped down, bare, at the risk of sounding very technical, but it's for all for the sake of clarity and in a way future proofing the principles here. But he said, this does not mean that we're, that this, this axioms, there are axioms in this book, is meant to prove the truth, which is 
to say that this is the last, the last word on, on this subject. So I kind of like that. And, you know, I believe he's aware of people who've tried that in the past and have failed. And if I remember correctly, it was Alfred North Whitehead who tried to prove all of math within a book he was writing. And then he got, <laughs> he got, uh, Go, Kurt Girdle, it's like, nah, nah, I can't do that. So maybe I'll, I'll do a series on, on that, uh, on a book called Girdle Escher Bach. It's another book that I find that is worth for me doing a deep, deep dive on. Yeah, so I think, yeah, we're, we're getting there. We're pretty much being set up and it's taking time to, to go through the introduction, but I think it's important. And soon we'll be reaching, uh, starting with the meat of this book. But then, uh, I'll see you then. I'll see you in the next, the next journey in my reading of Forest Landry's An Imminent Metaphysics. Enjoy the rest of your day.